Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's first ever SIF 45 Streams Happy Hour, which is sponsored by Great Lakes Brewing Company. I am Patrick Shepard, the Associate Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival, and our friends at Great Lakes Brewing Company encourage you to put your phone down during this happy hour and consider replacing it with a fresh Great Lakes beer. I'd like to introduce Kelly Parker from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center, who will be interpreting with us during the first half of our program tonight. Kelly, thank you for being here. Okay, so this is the first full day of the festival. We want to ensure that you know that we have a full array of FAQs, that's Frequently Asked Questions, and how-to videos on our website to navigate our SIF45 streams platform. And if you're ever having trouble, all you need to do is email us at streams at clevelandfilm.org. We've got people staffed from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll do everything we can do uh, to help you uh, navigate the, the festival platform. So each night of the festival, our filmmakers and guests answer questions about their films. If you're watching live, and you'd like to ask a question, just use the YouTube chat feature over on the right-hand side. Our, moderator, our moderators will, be, will ask selected questions to the filmmakers and guests. And on tonight's happy hour, we'll be joined by guests from the films Medicine Man, The Stan Brock Story, and Lily Topples the World. Uh, before we get to our first segment, let's welcome SIF Artistic Director, Mallory Martin. Mallory, hello there. Let me just say, in basking in, in the wake of opening night last night and the incredible Q&A, uh, to me it was one of the best opening night Q&As in, in all of my years at the festival. And, and I think it, there's a variety of reasons. First of all, the, the director of Together Together, Nicole Beckwith, was just delightful and engaging. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, you conducted a great interview, but you also had the time to do that because normally when we're in the in-person festival, people are kind of anxious to get over to the party. They want to get on the <laughs> dance floor. They want maybe a little bit of food because they're hungry. Uh, and uh, I just thought it was such an enriching conversation. So great work. Thank you, Pat. I mean, I think I'm I'm right there with our audience. I'm usually the first one over to the wine table on opening night, so I actually really welcome the opportunity to have a have a longer in depth conversation with her. And plus, I mean, when somebody's as personal and and like you said, delightful as Nicole is, it's it's my job is easy. It's not even really a job at that point. But I heard from a couple of people today. Um, that they wanted it to go, you know, longer, and I, I wish that it could too. I think people wanted the film to go longer too, in some ways. So I think that was fitting. But I think Nicole's a phenomenal filmmaker. I can't wait to see what she does next, and hopefully we can actually bring her to Cleveland in person um, next with her next film. So so we'll see. But I hope everybody enjoyed the film last night that got to see it. Uh, I believe we will be if it's not up already. Uh, we'll have the Q and A from last night up on our YouTube page soon too, in case anybody missed it last night. All right. Well, so I'm, um, as you know, I'm, I'm Mallory Martin. I'm the artistic director of the Cleveland International Film Festival. Um, and I think at this point, uh, we're going to move on to our first segment of the happy hour uh, with the film Medicine Man, the Stan Brock story. So I'm very happy and very honored to introduce uh, the director, Paul Michael Angel, and producer Vladimir B. Daniel. Thank you guys so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Hi. It's, it's an honor to be here in the uh, happy hour time. Yeah, <laughs> I have to say, it's what time is it there for you guys? Because you guys are both, are you in London or outside of London? Yeah, we're in London at the moment. It's uh, it's the morning for us. It's 1 a.m. So, uh, you know, they say that these film festivals, usually if you're out past midnight, that's when the magic happens. So we're, we're fully in the zone and ready to go and hopefully kick off in style. Right. <laughs> I think you guys have, have a beer or two, so it's, it's we perfect. We do. It's not, not a great life, <laughs> unfortunately, but it's a brew dog, which is represented in Ohio. So. <laughs> yes, it's perfect. All right. Well, I have to say I'm, I'm so excited that this is our first live happy hour Q&A, um, as Medicine Man was the first film programmed for SIF 45 Streams this year. 
Uh, I saw it at DAC NYC um, and I emailed Vladimir and Paul immediately. And luckily for us, they said yes. Uh, I knew that this, um, you know, had SIF written all over it. I think our audience is just going to fall in love with this film and fall in love with, with Stan. I don't know how anybody could not. Um, so thank you again to, to both of you for, for being here with us tonight, but for sharing your film with us um, and, and letting our audience experience it as well. I think the best place to start is with an update on RAM, on re remote area medical, if we can get one from you. Um, I have like three questions tied to that. What's the status of the organization uh, since Stan's passing? Um, how many expeditions are they currently at? And specifically, if you guys um, can talk a little bit about RAM's efforts in uh, Ohio specifically, that would be great to hear about. So whoever wants well, to start. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you should start about the handover. Well, well, firstly, um, thank you for having us at the festival. And it is very flattering to think that um, you just immediately wanted to program us. And now we're very lucky to be on the first night uh, of Q&A. Um, it's nice that the film's in Ohio, because Ohio is one of those places that remote area medical and, and Stan's work has a, a meaningful connection with. Um, I think in 2001, Remote Area Medical first came to um, Ohio. And I think it was a dozen or so clinics across um, 2001 and 2002. And those destinations, uh, those locations are not memorized, but I do have a list in front of me here. It was Belmont County, Morgan County, Athens County, Washington County, Meigs County, Jackson County, Jefferson County, Bell County, and Franklin County. So a couple wow. of those he went, the organization went to a couple of times, um, making up uh, about a dozen or so. Um, and then Remote Era Medical, to cut a long story short, crossed the whole of America uh, for the next 15 years, but then did eventually return to Ohio in 2018. And there were clinics in Ashtabula, Youngstown, Dayton. Um, and just to bring things entirely up to date, uh, there will be another um, remote area medical clinic in Columbus in July this year. So it's a nice long-standing connection to Ohio for this film. Um, and I should also point out that in 2018, um, remote area, um, the law was changed in Ohio, permitting out-of-state medical practitioners to come into the state and uh, deliver free care. Um, the, the very issue that we um, deal with in, in the film. Mm -hmm. um, it, I know that Stan and Remote Area Medical's work was instrumental in having um, the, that law changed. Uh, it was a waiver. I think it was a state waiving their license fee. Right. Okay. Yeah. I've just got, so that, that is the, like the, the legal status at the moment that people can practice. And that's partly due to some of their work. So that, I think that kind of gives you an idea of, um, yeah, their connection to Ohio. Uh, maybe Vladimir could talk a bit about, um, what the guys have been up to since, um, we, we finished making our film. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, that was, that was a great summary uh, about Ram's long-standing presence in the state and some things in there which I wasn't even aware of. Um, in terms of the handover um, from Stan's passing, that's something that um, was handled really well at Remote Area Medical, I think, because Jeff Eastman, who's a long-standing volunteer, is the current CEO, and he's actually the person that Stan picked as his successor. And Jeff's got a really interesting background. He, you know, is a really strong, um, he has a lot of experience in big corporate. And, you know, he says that he got to a stage in his life where his kids were going off to college and he wanted to do something to really give back. And it's a really touching story. He saw the 60 Minutes piece about remote area medical in 2008 on television, like so many people did. And he picked up the phone and he thought, you know, the head of the organization is there at the front of the line calling numbers. I could do that. He's probably got more important things to do. So he called up and said, hi, you know, could I come and help you at some of these clinics? Maybe I can call the, the numbers. Little did he know that calling the numbers was, you know, the ultimate honor, actually, um, within RAM. Um, 
he came along and he just started out helping as, as a hall monitor as, as he describes it and he kept coming and coming and coming and eventually there came a time when stan said you know what jeff why don't you call the numbers today and now jeff eastman's you know effectively taking ram into next into the next decade still running it with the same ethos they had on the stan brock where it's all about stretching the dollar it's about going where the need is greatest it's you know it's all about it's all about giving back they've not really corporatized um, as an organization i think that's really important actually um and in terms of what they've been doing uh since then passed in the first year it was very much continuing the legacy doing as many clinics as they can going to as many states as they can um but since coronavirus started obviously the pandemic hit them quite hard from two fronts really on the one side donations obviously dried up because of uncertainty and people having to tighten their wallets and on the other hand they were having to cancel a lot of clinics because mm -hmm. you obviously couldn't have these large gatherings um in the midst of a pandemic however very much again in the ethos of stan's um, approach rather than sitting on our laurels or worrying about the coffers running dry they actually put <clears throat> the time into researching real kind of state-of-the-art approaches to being able to hold clinics in a limited capacity in a manner that's safe to do so so you know for the past few months they've been holding um these clinics where they've been reduced capacity but everything is is kind of cold and dark there are always procedures in place all the air is getting purified everything's getting sterilized all the time so even though they can't help as many people they can still help some and the things that they've observed is that the need is increasing around the country you know that's one of the reasons they're having to come back to ohio now um you know so i, th I think i think hats off to them they're doing they're doing a really a really great job yeah, and thank you for the update, especially during the pandemic, because that was a question I was going to ask you as well, is if they were still able to hold the clinics and how incredibly hard that probably has been for, for them. But I'm so well, sorry, Mallory, one thing, one thing I did neglect to say, which is actually very important, and that's actually as well as doing all of this, they also helped to staff drive in COVID testing sites all over the country during the height of the pandemic. That's actually the first thing that they did. Um, mm -hmm. And now they're also helping to distribute vaccines. So the, the so fully engaged with that as well. It's so great to hear. Um, okay, so on to my next question. So clearly you two are British. Uh, most people I know outside of the United States are just dumbfounded by the US healthcare system. Um, is that what led you to this story first or did you find Stan Brack first and then of course have to tell his story? What sort of came first in, in both of your worlds? <laughs> you wanna start? Um, I have to admit that Stan came first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's such an exceptional character. Um, uh, uh, in 2011, um, I was working as a cam operator on um, documentary TV and feature films. And I wanted to, to attempt my first um, feature film documentary. Um, and I was aware already of the difficulty people in the United States had and, and this incredible paradox that the world's wealthiest nation would struggle to provide decent health services to so many of the population, 40, 50 million people perhaps. Um, I, I did know of that. Um, hmm. And then suddenly I find this Sunday Times News article and it's got the incredible Stan Brock life story, which which we now know from the film. Um, but it also describes a very enigmatic character who, who we're not really sure what drives him and what journey he's he's on in life. Um, and of course, there's all the the, the U.S. clinic, um, the U.S. clinic stuff. So. Um, I thought, wow, th this is exactly what I'm looking for, a, a one man's life, which seemingly encapsulates this really important social issue. You know, that's the stuff that good documentary films are made of. So after reading the article on a Sunday night, sort of serendipi serendipitously, I think, 
I'll, I'm just going to call the office now and, and, and see what happens. So I Google it and find the number and I call the office sort of expecting to just leave an answer machine message. And sure enough, this sonorous British accent picks up the phone and says, hello, remote area medical, Stan Brock speaking. And I just think, oh, wow, like this guy's the real deal. He's in there on a Sunday uh, working away, you know, like seven days a week. Like th th that just absolutely convinced me, oh, now I have to try to convince this guy to allow us to make a film about him. So um, fortunately, he, he decided to go ahead with us. Um, there were other filmmakers in the mix, but I think maybe he saw some sort of affinity in some sort of parallel in, in our ethos. I mean, we were small and kind of DIY outfit. And I wonder if that um, that parallel and, and our Britishness may be encouraged Dan to commit to us. We weren't very experienced filmmakers, so, you know, it wasn't easy on paper. So there must have been, yeah. I think, some other reason. Well, I love that you brought that up, too, because, I mean, I think that, you know, th so this film is part of our new Democracy's Heroes sidebar this year, which I have to say I really kind of created um, because of Stan, too. I mean, there's other films in, in the sidebar for sure, but I think he's the epitome of a hero. Um, but, you know, he's also not very comfortable uh, being in the spotlight. So can you guys yeah. both talk a little bit about, well, you know, the man behind the mission and, and what that was like? Um, I felt like the big unknown when I'd read the article and kind of got to know a little bit about Stan was uh, the big unknown was he. This is a guy like looking for a family, and is is Ram this this family that he's been looking for? Has he effectively um, come home? But when I got into the film, what I realised was there was this other equally poignant, maybe more powerful story about somebody learning to care. Um, he just kept coming back to this pivotal moment with the cowboy that dies on the trail and they have to just bury him um, right there. And although Stan doesn't react to that um, inciting incident, so-called, in, in his life within a couple of years, it takes kind of like 10 to 15 years before he has a chance to kind of put that right. Um it still seems to be like the absolute um, psychological driver, I think, behind um, a lot of his behavior in that second half of his life. I mean, let's not forget that Stan was 49 when he started Remote Area Medical. That, that's pretty inspiring to me as I sit here in my, my gray hair and my tweed jacket and I'm, I'm 43. Um, so, but that, I mean, that doesn't really answer your question about why, how did Stan kind of come to terms with the the fact that he realized he had to put himself out there to, to make this work. He had to give up himself to be able to kind of give the greater gift of remote area medical t to others. It's, um, it's, really, it's really interesting, actually, if I could sort of, sort of pick up, because I had a conversation today, sort of per chance, with Jeff. When I mentioned the CEO of Ram, and we were just talking about some of the promotional efforts we're uh, doing at the moment to, you know, get the screening noticed and, and get people tuning in and voting for us to win this global health prize that we're in the running for. And I said to them, having worked with Stan, you know, clearly he was, he did know what he was doing in terms of publicity. He was great at getting attention on remote air medical and on the cause and getting people to talk about it. And I said to them, how, you know, I, I never met Stan, unfortunately. I came into the project about half halfway through and, and, and Stan passed away in 2018. And I said to him, you know, from your experience, how was he able to have that PR savvy yet be so uncomfortable with it? And what Jeff said was really insightful. He said, Stan knew exactly what he was doing in terms of promoting the organization and the cause because that's something he 
wholeheartedly believed in, the one thing that he never was comfortable with is sort of promoting himself. So he's very self-deprecating, he's very humble, but I think that's what maybe gave him the sincerity and the authenticity to get so much attention because so many people that coming from the background that he came from, where they were very successful in various things in life, where they were renowned, you know, as movie stars, as celebrities or whatever else, you know, it's like these people that start crowdfunders when they're billionaires. It's like, what are you doing? You know, and Stan, I think, never, ever, ever strayed anywhere near to being in that bracket. And I think he'd have been completely embarrassed to be classed as somebody in that bracket. So he was always very careful to promote the cause, but very reluctant to promote himself in the process, if that makes sense. I mean, I don't know if that was your feeling as well, Paul, but I was just, just a conversation I had this afternoon quite, quite randomly, which is very relevant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I would say so. He he cut off enough cloth, uh, just as, as much as he needed to kind of fashion fashion a uh, public profile for himself. He didn't want to, yeah, he absolutely didn't want to really divulge personal information. I mean, I think the appeal of Stan is that he is an antidote to this modern age where people clamor for fame and celebrity but without much substance behind it whereas he saw the fame so-called as a means to an end he needed he wanted just enough of it so that he could use it to promote um, the work of remote area medical um, any more than than he had i think he would have been kind of sick of it mm. Well, Paul, well, Paul, just on that note, can you just tell them, sorry, it's a really great story, but this kind of tells you everything you need to know. It's like you get these, uh, you know, celebrities that will go out on charity missions or whatever to, 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 to wherever it may be in the world, and they're staying in five-star hotels, and that's getting paid for with a charity. Paul, tell, tell them what happened when Stan came to London. That's, that's quite a good story. <laughs> so, Stan, um, we had a UK shoot. Um, entirely binned, uh, <laughs> five days work, just tossed, uh, tossed by, by into the wind. But such is the life of uh, documentary filmmaking. And um, <laughs> so he flies to the UK, and um, I pick him up from Heathrow, and it's like very, I think it's like five thirty a.m. in the morning. And by the way, he stood up on the flight because obviously sitting down is bad for you in Stan's book. So he stood up the whole way, probably asked the pilot to fly the plane, maybe even told him he was doing it wrong. But yeah, so he got to London eventually and Paul picked him up. So, so he clearly, he hasn't slept. He's, he's a real stoic and he's making nothing of it. You know, he'll be fine. Um, and so we get to... Um, my house and i realized that his hotel um isn't ready for him yet because it's so early in the morning he can't check in so mm. we hang out in my um living room for a moment and then i say to him oh you know you should probably try and get some sleep here or something I mean, you must be absolutely shattered um i'll just prepare the um the room for you so um prepare the room and get him in there and um, he, he settles in. And after about 45 minutes, I think, oh, I better just like poke my head around the door to um, <laughs> check that he's okay. So I look, I look um, th through the door and Stan has taken the mattress and put it up <laughs> against the wall. And he's taken all the bedding and pushed it to the side and he's just sleeping without any covers or any mattress on the carpet, just happily snoozing away in his uniform. And I, th and I thought, God, he's, yeah, he truly is the, the Amazonian cowboy, even seventy eight, age 78, you know, all these years later. So just another one of those moments when you realise he was, he, was, he was for real. The guy was totally authentic. Right, yeah, I think genuine is, is the word that definitely comes to mind when, when you think about Stan. So um, I have a question from the audience and I kind of want to lead into that. So, you know, we're at a little bit of, not a little bit, quite a bit different place in America um, than we were at the end of the film. Um, 
you know, President Biden has extended Obamacare for another two years. Um, but as you point out in the film, the Affordable Care Act doesn't cover dental or vision care for adults. Um, so the question that we have that came in is, you know, what do you two specifically feel is is the answer for American health care at this time? And what should we be writing our congressmen and women about? Well, so that's a big one. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy to lead on that one. I mean, we don't want to particularly pick sides and get involved in the politics very much in the keeping you know the ethos of stand but i think coming at it from a european perspective and having spent time in america um it's fascinating to me personally that there is such opposition to people having health care as a human right everywhere on the world everywhere else in the world pretty much seems to provide that and you know, for all these fears of socialism, you know, the police forces, federally government funded, the fire department is government funded, the, you know, civil service uh, is, is, you know, federal workers are government funded. So why is healthcare not, you know, why is healthcare suddenly socialism when that becomes government funded? I think the medical industrial complex in America is a bit perverse. And I think the system does need to change and unfortunately it's been a political issue for so long um, that the human elements become lost for a lot of people and what we really want to do with this film is to show people what is actually happening on the front lines and I think most people if they go to a RAM clinic and they see those people queuing up overnight to get health care and they see how grateful those people are you know, for such a basic, you know, human need being met, um, I don't think most of them would go home that night and sleep well and think that this should be happening in a country like America. So without getting political about it, I think the system does need to change. And I think Stan believed that the system needed to change. But at the same time, we need to bear in mind that it's a human issue. We need to help these people right now. And that's what Stan did first and foremost. He didn't see Ram as a solution, but instead of becoming a lobbyist, he felt that he should be out there doing something. So, um, you know, I think more people need to go out there and actually see what this situation looks like on the on the front lines and pull somebody that's been there and seen it for a sound. So, you know, I'll leave it to him to comment. I mean, in a nutshell, I am for a free, at the point of delivery, universal healthcare system. Um, but I am very conscious of the level of division uh, with people in the United States currently, really. And I, I wouldn't want any changes in the system to come um, at the expense of like further division. But... At the same time, it does seem that wanting change towards a more equitable healthcare system does seem to be a bipartisan issue now. Maybe that's something that's different from when we started filming in 2012. Um, I recall at the start of the fil uh, start of filming, talk of um, you know free healthcare did provoke. Uh, responses of all oh, socialism and communism but interestingly by the time we'd got to kind of like 2016 um, the rhetoric of um, healthcare for all had become more popular and current and was coming out of politicians mouths you know mm -hmm. so I and, I and I saw I think in the last year a study that says um, it, it is a, 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 the desire for change to make the system more affordable it is an issue that both voters on both sides of the divide um, are keen are keen on. So, you know, maybe this is actually a, a really important moment in the history of, of US healthcare that, that can be seized upon because I think to, to, to want a system that's more equitable, that looks a bit more like other systems in other Western countries, doesn't mark you out as a, a political loony in, in the way it, it might have done, you know, 10 years ago. 
So I'm hopeful for change, but yeah, I, I would. I think it can be done on a kind of broad brush consensus basis. It doesn't have to be some huge ideological war. I mean, one thing to be said for Stan, one of the many things he achieved was he was able to bring people together from both sides of the aisle to come to these clinics to get treatment, to volunteer at these clinics. And many patients actually end up becoming volunteers. Now, that's people from all over the country, from both sides of the aisle. So if Stan was able to unite people by showing them what was happening on the front lines, then hopefully more politicians can take a leaf out of his book and maybe do the same. I mean, Bernie Sanders, um, who's obviously a proponent of Medicare for All, actually did an interview for us which didn't make it into the film. And the thing that really sticks with me is that we asked him, what was it about Stan that gave him the ability to go to Congress or the Senate and talk to these politicians and make them listen? The answer was simple. Bernie Sanders said, Stan was not a talker, he was a doer. He was out there on the front lines and he showed millions of people what was going on. And you couldn't argue with somebody like that because he was there and he was getting his hands dirty and he was doing it, you know? That's, uh, that, I think that's, that's really refreshing. I hope that this film can inspire a lot of people. Yeah, no, I, I know that it will. And I, I think the, the question that is presented a couple times um, within the film from Stan and, and, and from others is, is the question that we need to keep asking, which is, is healthcare a privilege or is it right? Um, and, and that's a question that will stick with me. Well, all right, I think that's all the time that we have for tonight, um, but I just want to thank you both again for, for, share, for sharing the film with us, for spending your time with us right now, and I'm hoping that we'll have another chance to, to speak with you um, later on in the week and, and share that with our audience as well. Thank you guys both for being here tonight. Hopefully you can finish your beer and get some sleep. I know it's really late there. <laughs> I was first, sleep comes next. Thank you so much for having us. It's, it's been a real pleasure, and we're really happy to be part of um, Cleveland International Film Festival. Douglas Blush, actually, I think he's had about 13 years with you guys, and he couldn't <laughs> yeah. speak highly enough of the festival. So he oh, said all along, you guys need to get to Cleveland, and lo and behold, you know, match made in heaven. So we're really, really glad to be part of it. Yeah, shout out to, to Doug Blush. It's a long time Sith friend for sure. So if you haven't yet voted for this film, make sure to do so on the Sif 45 streams platform using the star rating system and give Medicine Man the chance to win some cash prizes. Medicine uh, I'll Man hand things you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hand things back over to our host, Patrick, for the second half of tonight's show. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Mallory. And a special thanks to Karen Schiller from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center, who will be interpreting for us for the rest of the evening. We do want to take a moment as we transition into the second half of tonight's happy hour to thank all of our special guests and our audience for raising a glass with us. And in my case, it's a can of Great Lakes Brewing Company, Burning River, uh, uh, for all of your support and for being here tonight. Um, we wouldn't be here without you, and we are bringing it home with your support. And we do want to consider, uh, we do want to ask you to consider contributing to our challenge match to support the future of our festival. Our goal is to reach $145,000 this year. And we are so grateful for any amount that you're able to give to donate. Please visit clevelandfilm.org forward slash donate. And now we're going to go into the second segment. And I'm so thrilled that uh, our great fest uh, festival friend, Julia Wong, uh, is with us here tonight. Uh, for many of you who've been with us for years, you'll recognize Julia because she helped with us at uh, uh, for our Film Forums educational program, and she worked at the City Club of Cleveland. Now she's the Senior Entrepreneurship Manager at Venture for America. Julia, thank you, and take it away. Thank you, Patrick. Um, another place you may recognize me is I got the opportunity to be featured in one of the film festival's trailers a few years ago. So always happy to be a friend of the film festival. Um, as Patrick said, I am Julia Wong, the Senior Entrepreneurship Manager at Venture for America. And I am so excited to introduce our special guests from the film, Lily Topples the World. Um, hello. With, hey. hello. Hi. With us, 
With us tonight, we have director, producer, cinematographer, editor, all of the things, Jeremy Workman. Hey, Thanks hey. so much for being here. Thanks for having us. And then we have the domino artist extraordinaire, Lily Hevish. Thank you so much for being here as well, Lily. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So to properly set us up for tonight's Q&A, we wanted to start by sharing a quick SIF tribute video created by Lily and her team to give you all just a taste of Lily's incredible talent in case you haven't seen the documentary. Um, so let's check this out. That is awesome. Thank you, Lily, cool. for, <laughs> for getting uh, that ready for us at the film festival. Of course. Um, awesome. So let's get started. Um, if all of you watching haven't watched Lily Topples the World yet, um, you will hear some spoilers tonight. Uh, I had the opportunity to watch it about a week ago, and I truly felt every single emotion in this movie. I like laughed. I cried. I turned around to the person I was watching it with, and I was like, why am I? sobbing. Um, I gasped numerous times. I just got chills watching those dominoes fall. So it was really inspiring. And I'd love to just start the conversation off with how this all started. Um, Jeremy, how did you find Lily? How did you reach out to Lily? Sure. Um, and Lily, what did you think when you were first offered this opportunity to work with Jeremy? Um, first of all, thanks, Julia, for, for moderating and hosting us. And thanks to the Cleveland International Film Festival. It's always been a, a festival I, I've wanted to play at for quite some time. So I'm really thrilled to bring this film here. Um, everybody, nobody worry. This is a fake background behind me. No, no dominoes are going to fall. Um, you can see I just I have a little green screen here. But uh, <laughs> this is, um, you know, a domino spiral that Lily did sometime during our shoot. Um, so this was an unusual film for me a little bit in that, um, my previous films were films that, you know, either I had been approached or I was developing for a long time. And with Lily, I approached her as a fan. And I think that's what made it so different for me as a filmmaker is I really approached her as a fan. I was, I was so interested in her as an artist, um, I was interested in domino culture. I was interested in um, what this says about sort of, you know, Gen Z creators and how Lily is so much at the forefront of that. So I approached her pretty much cold calling her. Um, you know, I, it, it wasn't my first film, so I had a lot, had a lot of ammo to, to, to go, go at with it. Um, but that was my approach. And um, I just knew that this was a story that, I I wanted to work on and and that would really connect with audiences. So it's unusual, right? Yeah, I remember Jeremy. He just sent me an email uh, during my first year of college, and he was just like, "Hey, I'm a filmmaker. I'm looking to do a new film, and I thought your stuff was really cool." And then I think I actually like forgot about the email for a little <clears> bit, <throat> and then he had to ping <laughs> me again to be like, "Hey, just following up." And then we like we got on a call. Um, I was just like doing college work. I don't know what I was doing at the time, but yeah, we got on a call and then a few weeks later, Jeremy came to my house. Uh, we met up, he met my parents and we just talked a little bit more about what the film would kind of look like, um, the process of making a documentary. And, you know, at the end, it just, it seemed like a great opportunity to just showcase domino art to the world and be able to tell my story in kind of a different way than you see in my YouTube videos, but, you know, more of a, a personal kind of approach. Yeah. You know, Lily is so, you know, she's, she's huge on YouTube, you know, I mean, she, for lack of a better description, she's a kind of a YouTube star. So it was definitely a, a, a different approach for, for us. We were like, look, this is a really amazing story and you have a really amazing story. How do we, how do we do it? How do we tell this story in a way that 
is is different from what your fans and your audience already can find with you. And that was something that Lily and I really talked about. And there was a real healthy sort of collaboration at the beginning where we were mm -hmm. trying to sort of crack the code a little bit. And uh, I we just started filming and we filmed for three years. Wow. Yeah. Well, I wanted to get into that a little bit because Jeremy, you mentioned this at the beginning too. There's so much you could have talked about with Lily, like identity representation, this new generation of content creators, new media. Lily, I feel like even in the documentary, your decision to leave college, that was pretty huge. And I think um, that was really impactful to me to watch and seeing kind of, what do you do when there's this traditional path, but you already started your career. Um, how did you all decide what to focus on? You know, after those three years of filming or as you're filming, how do you decide what to focus on? I could start. I just, you know, I, I basically said to Lily, like, look, I'm going to kind of embed into this process. I'm going to be there. I'm going to film. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be over your shoulder half the time. If you're doing the Tonight Show, I want to be there. If you're talking to uh, an elementary school, class, I want to be there. So I just sort of said, I want to just film and film and film mm -hmm. and we'll figure out what, what the, how to, how to turn this into a narrative and what the, the key elements were. We got really lucky as, as I'm sure the viewers have, have noticed that it coincided with these incredible things that were happening for Lily starting with, you know, as you saw, the movie starts with her in college, her first year. And then there's these sort of two or three years where you just watch her kind of skyrocket and all these things are happening for her. So it was a little bit serendipitous in that way. Um, but I just knew that there was a lot of really interesting subtext. Um, mm -hmm. there was, it was just a really rich story. Um, Lily's a great character. And I just knew that there was just a lot there to explore. Lily, yeah. had, do you have thoughts on, on, <laughs> on that? I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, I just remember Jeremy filming everything, like even the most mundane things like eating lunch or just like <laughs> sitting or like just on my bed or eating breakfast, which didn't make the cut. But, you know, just like <laughs> very random things. Jeremy was there just filming it and then, you know, told the story from this huge massive footage that he had to edit down um, and figure it out that way. But I think it was it's kind of a neat process because he was learning things as he went through the edit and kind of figured out the story more and more as he filmed. Mm -hmm. Lily, were you surprised by the story and like themes of your life that were told? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, the story has made me think a lot about, um, you know, my Asian heritage being adopted, um, what that means for me and how, um, how I process that in a personal sense, as well as with others and how I am able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely brought me back to a lot of like, just themes around like who I am and trying to answer these open-ended questions. Yeah. I was just Go gonna ahead, add what, what, what was also, we, I think both of us were noticing and I was definitely sort of feeling it when we were shooting was that there? this was like starting what, what we first approached as this profile of an artist. You know, that mm -hmm. was probably our, our entry point when we began. Oh, it's going to be this incredible profile of this amazing Gen Z artist. And the footage that I was getting and that I was filming with Lily and she was inviting me to film was starting to be more almost like a coming of age movie. You know, there I was with her in college and with all her friends when Lily's making this decision, should I stay in college? And she's breaking down and crying because she's going to leave her friends and she has to make these very huge life decisions about, you know, personal, professional. And it started, I think, to dawn on both of us that it was a little bit of a story of, of a young woman sort of kind of discovering, um, you know, a, 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 a a bigger, stronger side of herself. Yeah, I, as a viewer, you definitely saw that. There's a couple point pieces of that that I want to talk about a little bit later on. And but one of those I think too is, um, you know, you said in this doc in this film, we saw Lily discover herself. In the movie, in the documentary, there's a scene where 
the world discovers who Hevish Five is. And Lily, I wanted to take you back there. Why in that the uh, the reveal video where you were like, this is Hevish Five. Um, there was a lot of like pretty cruel comments before then. And I assume even after that, why did you decide to finally kind of reveal yourself um, when you did? Yeah, I realized on YouTube that a lot of people who were making videos, they were being personalities. They were talking to their cameras and getting this like two way dialogue between the people who are watching and the creator. And I realized after six and a half years of making videos that being anonymous was very limiting because I wasn't able to express myself like as a human, you know, I was just behind the camera, just building the dominoes. They just saw the dominoes. They didn't see my face and hear my voice. And, you know, it was kind of a pain when I wanted to make, you know, maybe a tutorial and do a voiceover, but I couldn't, or, um, you know, develop a deeper connection with my audience, but I wasn't able to really speak to them unless I put text on screen, which mm -hmm. isn't really as effective. So I knew at that point, you know, I, I wanted to develop more of um not like a like a, not a persona but just be on my channel so that people could put a face to the artist who's actually making these creations and be able to talk to them and and really share my passion with a whole new audience who maybe have never even heard of dominoes so it was pretty intentional i mean you started the channel when you were technically not allowed to have a YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> so I imagine it was a pretty intentional choice in the beginning to not show your face. And was that just yeah, a pattern? Sure. So in the beginning, like I was of course very young. I was like nine or 10 when I started posting videos. And, um, you know, I, I didn't want really to show my face because I just wanted to put my work out into the world. And I wanted people to appreciate mm -hmm. the art and not necessarily like know a lot about who I am just because I was a young girl. Um, but at, at a certain point I felt really ready and I was always planning to do a reveal video at some point. I just didn't know when, and then the, the opportunity just kind of like hit me at a certain point when, um, I, I met up with a bunch of builders at a, a large event. And that was the first time that a lot of people, um, kind of discovered who I was and was able to meet me and found out that I was a girl. So it was just the right timing. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. You know, there's there's so many, especially now, there's so many domino artists. And yet it's still just, you know, the male to female ratio is 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 staggering. And um, it, not only was Lily sort of the only woman practitioner here, she was also the best. So it just kind of, the, there was a, a real sort of, there's a real sort of disconnect, you know, in terms of, uh, those creators on YouTube and and in this sort of specific art form. And, you know, it's it's really quite interesting. And Lily sort of, you know, stands out in such in so many ways because of that. I my one of my favorite parts of I think the editing of of the film was when you would show everyone's YouTube subscriber numbers. <laughs> and I laughed because Lily, you were the clear winner for everyone, including like Will Smith. And <laughs> I just thought that was really a testament to how well you do your craft and the following. And I think how probably, you know, the impact that you as a person has made on this art form. And when you revealed yourself as Havish Five, um, did that have an immediate change on the work that you were doing and the art that you were doing? Or did it kind of, uh, was it a slower transition to revealing more of your personality? Yeah, I think once I did the reveal video, there was a pretty big change in my content in the sense that I made a clear effort to make sure that I was in my videos after that video. So whether that's like me talking at the end in an outro or, you know, doing a behind the scenes where I'm actually talking to the camera now and being able to show the viewers what I'm working on, mm -hmm. um, I, I really tried to kind of incorporate more of my personality so that people could kind of get a sense of who I am and and learn from me because I, I want to share my passion with others and my excitement I, I hope will get other people excited about dominoes and um, you know it, it was 
it took some time and I definitely wasn't super comfortable being on camera at first because it's just like awkward when you like start filming yourself but yeah. you know th throughout the years you get better and I, I knew that um, you know becoming more of a personality it would help not just on YouTube but also like help me with public speaking and you know how to film and just be more aware of myself I guess yeah uh, I think what's interesting too is you have this background in filming yourself right and and being on YouTube and then you have Jeremy come in who wants to take on that role um, what was it like working with um you know someone who's made films and jeremy what was it like the the relationship between you two working together because both of you do film just in a very different way yeah i thought it was really cool i mean jeremy he's in a whole different world making documentaries which is like very very pro um very polished in a way but like i'm making youtube videos so i'm just like I'm doing jump cuts, like I'm doing things that you traditionally wouldn't do in like mm -hmm. cinema. So it, it's it's been funny to kind of see the contrast of uh, Jeremy applying more traditional editing techniques to videos. And I'm just like doing all these crazy freestyling stuff. It, but like we both understand each other because we're mm -hmm. both in different we're, we're both filmmakers, but in different worlds. But we can yeah. see where each is making their their decisions. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I, I thought that was so fascinating for me, too. I mean, and, and it's a, Julia, it's a really good question because, you know, Lily is a really accomplished filmmaker and represents a kind of filmmaking of, you know, a young, a different, a younger generation than, than me that has, that is putting out their content immediately on YouTube. And I'm obviously coming from a more traditional background of independent film and documentary and movie theaters. I, I found myself quite a bit relying on some great footage that Lily would shoot. And mm -hmm. there were a number of times when we, w when I was editing some big domino scene and I just knew that her footage was gonna be often better than mine, but really helpful as well to tell the story. Um, you know, without a doubt, I, by the end of the movie, I was like, okay, I'm prob I probably filmed Domino's more than anyone on planet Earth other than Lily. And yeah. <laughs> yet the, the divide between where Lily is and where I am is huge. So there were so many times when I would sort of take a cue from her in terms mm -hmm. of how best to, uh, to shoot something, how to cover it. Um, and often I was very confident in knowing that, hey, I could always sort of, you know, lean on Lily's footage if I have to in some of these big set pieces. Um, that said, a lot of the movie was also a different kind of style, which was this kind of verite, hey, it's just me with a camera. <clears throat> As Lily mentioned, you know, she's making eggs and I'm filming her. So that was also like a very different style as well. And I, I think it was neat uh, I, I would think it was probably neat for her to see that kind of approach to to movie making also, which is very sort of um, casual and personal mm -hmm. and 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 informal. Yeah, it felt really personal, especially in the the moment where you asked Lily, "Can I ask you something personal?" I felt I felt like I was intruding on like a personal moment and between two friends, and I almost wanted to be like, "Okay, I'll give you your space." It's a lesson for documentary filmmakers in a way, because, you know, that's a really incredible scene and, and Lily's really revealing and we learned so much about her as a person. And yet it was like, you know, it was like seven o'clock at night. It was the end of the day. I was going to leave. Uh, it was just me. I was hanging out in her office. I had my camera and I'm just like, hey, let me ask you some questions, you know, and it just it, it, it just reminds you that when you are, especially for documentaries, you, you're you're sometimes approaching things in these kind of non-traditional ways where where you want people to be unguarded. And, and Lily is so used to cameras, she'd be the first to admit that. So, you know, sometimes we had to really kind of fight through that to really kind of find that next level. And that was a, a, a case of that. Yeah, that's awesome. So we have um, uh, some questions from the audience coming in, but I did wanna, before we jump into some audience questions, 
just ask uh, one thing about um, the business side of things. That was another kind of coming of age moment we saw, Lily. And not only were you often, um, you know, the only woman or person of color in these domino um, uh, competitions and exhibitions, but you, we also saw you be that person in these rooms of toy execs. Um, and again, you are the, uh, you're sharing what they need to know. You're kind of guiding the conversation. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like now to be building a brand and maybe what kind of the business of Havish Five is like and what your team is like now? Yeah, so building a brand, I mean, I never really expected to build a brand, but I just, through making videos and YouTube, it kind of like, you get pushed into the sense of like, okay, I got to make a brand. Like, what does, what does my channel stand for? How am I going to showcase that to the world? Um, so I guess in terms of Hevish Five, it, it became more of like, okay, well, I, I want people to feel like good about what I'm, what they're watching and consuming. Like we're very, we're a very positive brand. We're trying to spread our love for, you know, STEM education and get people into building. Um, and I, I guess, you know, it's just a long process. I'm learning every single day in terms of the business and branding side, but I, I found that it's just more than what you make almost like in terms of the Domino projects or any kind of art form nowadays, everything is all about branding. Like you can have the greatest product in the world, but if nobody knows your brand or is even aware of it, then it's not going to do anything. You'll have a great product, but nobody will be able to use it because they don't know about it. So I think with YouTube and social media, especially it's a, it's an awesome approach nowadays since everyone's on social media now to build your brand almost first before you even yeah. create a product. Um, because then you have that credibility, you have yeah. the influence, you have people who trust you, who see me as the domino expert and trust that I'm going to make a product that I know will deliver and will work properly and that I, I use. So yeah, uh, branding is everything now. Um, and you know, if, if you can use what you've built in your brand to help others and, and create things beyond that and build your business, then I think that's going to set you up for a, a long-term um, sort of career in, in the future if you do want to extend this out to something bigger. Yeah, I, that I think rings, that's just so smart. That's so wise. And you, you've done that with Heaven Five and building that brand first, it's, it's really important. Um, well, let's take out a question. Um, we got a question from Martin for Lily. Thank you, Martin, for watching and submitting a question. Um, Lily, what would be your dream domino exhibition space or design? Great question, Martin. So in terms of a space, I don't think it exists. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So my dream domino space would be like a giant room. I, I don't even know how many square feet, but like think of like a gym, but like double that with perfect flooring no lines like no gymnasium marks or anything um it's just like a perfect floor solid color and we have like uh camera rigs set up we have a camera crane maybe there's like stadium seating around it so we can have live events and it's just a giant space where we can all build dominoes um and then my my dream design uh i don't know if this is a specific design but i would love to at some point break the domino world record with a ton of other builders. We get this huge team together and we set up like 5 billion dominoes. I yeah, love that. I <laughs> it's a lot. Um, I love how you mentioned the perfect flooring. <laughs> it's so key that people probably just don't ever consider when they invite you somewhere. Oh yeah, I mean, you can't have cracks in the floors really. It has to be very level. If it's too slippery, then the domino is just gonna go everywhere and there'll be more fails. So yeah, we'd probably need like a, a custom floor. <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I've seen Lily like walk into rooms and immediately her eyes dart to the floor cause she's like inspecting whether it's gonna be good for dominoes. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's a subconscious kind of reaction. <laughs> I love that. Um, we got another question here from Tom. 
Um, so thank you, Tom. Uh, the question is, your team was really great. How do you choose who you work with? Is that I think, for I me? I think that's for Lily. Mm -hmm. I think that's for okay. Lily, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so my team, so my dad is my business manager. He's number one fan. He's doing, he's doing a lot of stuff on the back end. Um, so yeah, my dad was the first person that I brought into my team. And like, I was 13 when I first got my first inquiry. So like, he was of course helping me out. And um, now I've expanded a little bit. So we have part-time community managers, uh, a part-time editor, and the person that I, I choose to work with, they first and foremost, they need to be passionate about the subject. So they, they're all into dominoes, um, you know, people who they they're in the YouTube space and they kind of understand how I'm creating content. Um, so like being in the social media sphere and having an understanding of that and also just being open to learning new things. Like I think with YouTube, especially uh, you have to be, you have to be able to learn a lot of different things quickly and be able to kind of adapt to the changing climate of social media. So someone who is um, not just open to it, but excited to learn more and be on this journey because it is a very small team. Um, we work pretty closely together. Yeah, that's awesome. It was really great to see all the folks that you worked with um, and get to know their personalities a little bit too, kind of side, side characters, even though they're real people. Um, we got a question from Karen, which I'll direct to Jeremy. Um, will this film play in theaters? If so, when? Well, it's playing yeah. at the film festival. <laughs> exactly. It'll be playing at, at the Cleveland International Film Festival um, until April 18th or so. I don't know if I have my date right. But um, <laughs> yes, it will most definitely come out this year in 2021 and should be at a theater near you, you know, God willing. So keep your ears out, uh, your ears open, your eyes open, and uh, we should have some um, exciting news so people could find the film later this year. Awesome. Well, we're about time, so I want to wrap up with um, the question that uh, I got the privilege to talk to Jeremy and Lily before and ask them, what do you want to be asked? So um, to Jeremy, to wrap us up, what was something that you learned about Lily while filming that was surprising? Yeah, this was a really good question. What did I learn about Lily that was really surprising? And, um, you know, there was so much, obviously. I mean, you know, just uh, you have to remember, you know, I, I filmed 600 hours or so of Lily and just went through so much and followed her, you know, to tons of cities and just was always sort of, you know, kind of behind her, behind her, you know, by her side. I think what, what was very instructive was watching... Lily navigate a very complex situation and keep a focus. And it was really inspiring. Um, like, for example, if you think, you know, she we're, we're at, you know, the Tonight Show and she's got a team of domino builders under her that are working for her and asking her a million questions. We have producers from The Tonight Show asking her a million questions. Her dad is bopping in and out, talking about, you know, some museum that wants to, to her to do a domino piece. There's a filmmaker behind her, you know, following her every move, you know, six inches from her and shoving a camera lens at her. And yet her job was to continually make incredible domino artwork amid all that. And it was just really um, instructive to watch how she was able to, how she's able to kind of keep focus and to say, okay, I have a job to do. I'm going to put all these distractions aside. I'm going to just do the best I can and be the best at what I do and do this for the next six hours. And none of this chaos around me is going to affect that. And obviously, we're also talking about an art form that if you accidentally hit hit, it all you know gets ruined. So just to sort of be able to watch that and see her navigate that and still be able to do her best work was really, really impactful to me and and instruct and instructive. Wow! Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Sure. <laughs> um, Lily, 
same question to you. What was something you learned about Jeremy while filming? Yeah, I guess I learned, well, I didn't know Jeremy beforehand. So like Jeremy had kind of an advantage kind of <laughs> knowing my, my YouTube videos, but um, something that surprised me, I guess, was how, how he approaches documentaries and, and how like, how strategic he has to be in order to make a documentary in, in the sense of like, I didn't realize how much work goes into not just filming, but like, getting the right permissions to be in a specific place, to have a camera there and to do that in a, in a respectful way that's not going to like mess up an event or, mm -hmm. you know, just be a distraction, but like getting a, a camera in the right place at the right time, it has to go through so many different types of people just to get, get that yes. And then to like travel there, be with me, coordinate, like, when am I gonna get mic'd up? Like, where are you gonna be when? And just like finagling all of these avenues and talking to people to convince them to get a camera in the right spot. I thought Jeremy was just brilliant with, you know, how he speaks with people to, um, you know, make a great film. I, I think that's something that's overlooked when you think about a documentary, you think about the film itself, mm -hmm. but now in the behind the scenes of me looking at it, I'm like, wow, like it takes a, a like it takes a certain kind of person to make a documentary and Jeremy like he's just made to make documentaries. <laughs> it's because whenever anybody says no, I just ignore them. <laughs> I love that. Thank well, you. yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Well, Jeremy, I'm glad that you were made to make documentaries because you were able to bring Lily Topples the world to us tonight and bring Lily to all of our living rooms, um, living rooms, wherever, desks, offices, wherever you are. Um, that is all the time that we have. So thank you both for joining us tonight. It was really wonderful to chat with both of you and learn a little bit more from the film. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Hope everybody awesome. enjoys it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you to everyone else for joining us for tonight's happy hour. Um, and thanks again to Great Lakes Brewing Company for sponsoring our happy hours. Tune in tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern time for another SIF 45 streams happy hour. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay, stay healthy, keep watching those films, and we'll see you next time.